Okay, I'm just letting everyone in at the moment. Assalamualaikum, brothers and sisters. Welcome, welcome. I'm just letting you in. Um, uh, we have Dr. Alia, who is the host, and we have Professor Farid here as well. So, um, just in a couple of more minutes. We're just waiting for everyone to come through. We have a full house. We're expecting around 100, but most likely we'll probably have just less than that. So, as you come in, please, if you don't mind, put your um, mics on mute. If you can put your mics on mute. Um, you can have your camera on if you want to. That's absolutely your choice. This is being recorded. Um, so if you did miss any sections, you'll have an opportunity to come back and have a look. We'll be putting it up on our website, on our YouTube page as well. So I'm just admitting a few more people. Admit all. Just another minute or so and we'll make a start. We had a, a surge of last minute uh, booking. Can I just remind everyone as you come in, uh, please mute, uh, please kindly mute all your phones or devices. Fantastic. Right. Okay. So just to remind everyone, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh, Ramadan Kareem. Uh, welcome to the Islamic Courses Zoom session on Ibn Khaldun towards a non-centric approach, non-Eurocentric approach of modern sciences uh, delivered by Professor Said Farid al -Abbas from the National University of Singapore. Uh, at the same time, this is being hosted by our very own uh, Honourable Dr. Ali Ibrahim from the University of London, SOAS. So, uh, welcome both of you. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Wa alaikum salam. Right, okay, so um, just quick housekeeping rules before I hand it over to Dr. Alia. Uh, number one, um, if you don't mind, everyone please kindly put your phones or devices on mute. It is being recorded, so you'll have a chance uh, to see this in your own time whenever, if you did meet any sessions. We, so very briefly, the structure is going to be, Alia is going to introduce and hand over to the professor. He'll have around 20, 25 minutes of his deliberation. After that, we will have Q&A. Uh, the Q&A will be set up via chat. If you want to directly ask the professor, that's absolutely fine, but it will be uh, Dr. Alia will, it's Dr. Alia's prerogative on who to allow or not. So without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Alia. Jazakumullah khairan. I hope you guys enjoy the show. Wa alaikum salam. Hello and welcome everybody. Assalamu alaikum. Ramadan Mubarak to everybody here. Uh, for those who've just joined, this is the uh, webinar Ibn Khaldun towards a non-Eurocentric approach to the modern social scientists, uh, to, the, to the modern social sciences. And we're very honoured to be joined by Professor Sayyid Farid Latas from Singapore University. Um, just a very quick uh, biography of Professor uh, Latas. Sayyid Farid Latas is a Malaysian national and he's a professor of sociology at the National University of Singapore. He also headed the Department of Malay Studies uh, at the National University from 2007 to 2013. He lectured at the University of Malaya in the Department of Southeast Asian Studies prior to joining uh, the National University of Singapore. His areas of interest are the sociology of Islam, social theory, religion and reform, and intra and interreligious dialogue. His most recent books are Ibn Khaldun, 2013, and Applying Ibn Khaldun of 2014. Now, um, some of you may be um, coming to this seminar um, familiar with Professor Farid Latas' work or possibly familiar with um, the work of his other scholarly forebears, um, his uh, father, uh, and his uncle are both, uh, and, and I think uh, your sister as well, Professor, if I'm not mistaken, are all uh, renowned um, thinkers, scholars, intellectuals, both in Southeast Asia and widely in the Muslim world. Um, uh, Professor, uh, Professor uh, Alatas's uh, uncle, I think, was um, quite renowned in, uh, in his work on Islamization of knowledge and uh, education. Uh, and his father also was um, 
uh, a well-known social scientist and politician, if, I, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and so there's quite um, an interesting family tree of, um, uh, of scholarly activity there. Uh, just to give a little bit of a brief about um, the, the, the themes that the professor is dealing with, and then I'll hand it over, uh, over to you. Um, and this is just by way of an introduction. It's generally believed that sociology originated in Europe in the 19th century, and the paternity of the discipline is commonly attributed to the Fen French sociologist Auguste Comte. However, reflections of a sociological nature were observed and found in the work of the 14th century North African historian and philosopher Ibn Khaldun. However, such contribution of Ibn Khaldun is little acknowledged by European scholars in their works. Uh, this is something I, I can very much relate to. I trained as a social anthropologist uh, and I've studied sociology, anthropology and various other social sciences. And um, there's very much a collective um, amnesia or sometimes deliberate ignoring in Western academia of the contributions of um, non-Western scholars and also scholars who are not from the Judeo-Christian tradition. Um, Professor Artas's work attempts to examine how Eurocentrism is embedded in the writing of European scholars and unpacks the contribution of Ibn Khaldun in the growth of sociology. Um, he argues that perspectives of European scholars are mainly Eurocentric and parochial in their accounts of culture, language and other aspects of non-European society. Professor Artas will explain Ibn Khaldun's contribution to the field of sociology as largely ignored though his contributions dealt with the society, with society, human character, political organization and government, as well as other things. Nevertheless, Professor Artas argues that though Ibn Khaldun's ideas have hugely impressed some European thinkers, to, uh, which has prompted them to regard him as a progenitor of modern sociology, the question remains as to how his ideas and theories have been appropriated by contemporary social scientists in their work. So that's just a little brief background. Um, over to you now, Professor, um, if you can give us um, a more deeper engagement. Thank you. All right. Uh, Salaamu Alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And um, Salaam Ramadan, uh, Ramadan Mubarak to everyone. Uh, first of all, thank you very much um, to Mizan, uh, uh, Mizan al Malik and to Dr. Alia Biari for the um, kind invitation. Um, I know you must all be very tired, maybe more tired than I am because it's 11 p.m. here and I've already uh, broken my fast. Um, and you, are, you have yet, I think, to break your fast. A few more hours to go, uh, many of you, I suppose. Um, but it must be a little bit harder for you, Professor. Thank, thanks for staying up for us. Well, you know, I, I was going to say that for, for all of you who, whose stomachs are still empty, uh, you're probably um, uh, more intellectually uh, capable right now than I am. Because, um, you know, as Rumi, Rumi said that um, uh, the, the, the mind is more active, um, the, the emptier the stomach, the more active uh, the mind, actually. Um, so you may have me at an, at an advantage. Um, so um, l we, we don't have too much time. This is not, I think, a regular, you know, 45 minute or one hour lecture. Um, so let me um, just jump into the, uh, the topic. Um, now, I want to begin by, uh, by providing the context, um, the, the context of um, our interest in Ibn Khaldun. And, and that context is, um, the problem of Orientalism or, or Eurocentrism in the um, social sciences. And I, I also want to, um, to stress that this problem of Eurocentrism is not the older problem of derogatory views about Islam or about Muslims or about people in the, um, in the so-called Orient or the so-called East. That is no longer, to me, the the major problem in the social sciences. It might be a problem in popular culture, in Western popular culture, for example, but um, the, the, the problem of derogatory views, um, you know, the idea that the East is backward, that um, 
Islam is a is a, a fake religion and so on and so forth. Um, uh, that uh, Orientals are inherently irrational. Um, th these were problems largely uh, in, in the scholarship of 19th century um, Western scholarship and early, perhaps early 20th century scholarship. But um, it is no no longer uh, the problem in um, uh, today, in the as far as the social sciences are, are concerned. But there is still a uh, a very serious issue um, with regard to um, knowledge production in the social sciences and humanities, um, uh, which I would call Eurocentric or Orientalist, which has to do with the um, the marginalization of uh, non-European thought and non-European thinkers. And this problem of marginalization has also resulted in a kind of distortion. So I, I'd like to just explain those two problems um, before I speak, um, uh, before I go to, to, to Ibn Khaldun. Um, the, the, the problem of, um, of knowledge production basically has to do with the destruction of knowledge systems, um, of non-European knowledge systems, to the extent that we have lost um, particular ways of looking at the world. And I would just like to give a very simple example of that. Uh, it's, it's a favorite example of mine because it really you know, vividly um, illustrates the problem. Um, you, you, you would have all read, and uh, I'm sure you're all familiar with a series of wars that were conducted between the 11th and 13th centuries um, that involved um, Europeans and um, Muslims. And, and we usually refer, we refer to, to these wars as the Crusades. Um, and these are referred to as the Crusades ev literally everywhere in the world. If you, if, if you are from uh, the Muslim world, uh, whatever language you speak, uh, Urdu, Persian, Arabic, Malay, uh, the, the word that you use is a translation of crusade. So the word that we are using, the term that we are using in our respective languages refers to these wars as, um, uh, refers to them as the war or wars of the cross, giving the impression that this was a war of Christianity uh, versus Islam. Um, this is the impression that we are given. And as a result, we, uh, we do, not, do not realize that this, the idea that this was a war between Christianity and Islam was a specifically European point of view during, the, during that period. The Europeans saw it as a war of Christianity against Islam. Um, but because we have been dominated by European terminology, um, our whole understanding of history reflects their understanding. We see the so-called crusades through the lens of the European uh, Christian um, experience. Um, the Muslims during that time didn't use the term crusades to refer to those wars. Um, and the Muslims did not even refer to the, uh, the crusaders as Christians. And they, they referred to them as Faranj or Ifranj, Franks. Um, and it, it's understandable from the Muslim point of view, because from the Muslim point of view, um, you know, they understood that these Europeans were European invaders um, who also killed Eastern Christians, who also massacred Eastern Christians, um, and, um, and who you know, conquered land in uh, Palestine and surrounding areas that uh, were inhabited by, by Arab Christians and Arab Jews. Um, so it wasn't simply a war of Islam versus Christianity from the Muslim point of view. But our terminology that we use today, and the term crusades is used by um, uh, us today, you know, um, in Hurub um, Salibia uh, in Arabic, Jange um, Salibi in Persian, Parang Salib in Malay and Indonesian. These terms generally came to us in the 19th century and after. They were not used before that. Um, so this is just one, you know, simple example of, uh, of how Eurocentrism has really played havoc with the way we, we understand um, uh, reality. Um, and um, as I said, there are two 
uh, big problems. One has to do with distortion. And I gave the example of uh, how we understand these, uh, these wars that um, um, are now almost universally referred to as crusades. Um, and uh, uh, I think related to that is the other problem of the marginalization of non-European traditions, non-European thinkers, non-European concepts uh, in um, uh, the whole process of knowledge production in the social sciences and, and humanities. And of course, um, Ibn Khaldun is, uh, is an example of, uh, um, is, is a case in point, you know, a, a victim of this marginalization. Um, now, let, let me just cite one more um, example of this uh, distortion. Um, if you take, um, you know, Hinduism, right? Um, this is a classic case of um, a Eurocentric or, or an Orientalist construction. Um, the idea of a unitary, a single religion um, uh, in India um, is a Eurocentric uh, construction that emerged um, largely during the colonial period. And, um, um, it, um, it is a result of the imagination of, uh, of Europeans that the people in India who were not Christians, Muslims, or Jews all constituted one religion. There wasn't a name for that religion, so it is the, the Europeans who named it Hinduism. Um, probably based on their looking at the religions of India, through the lens of Christianity, through their own experience in Europe, where you have a single religion, Christianity, consisting of different sects and denominations. Um, so they impose that model on the religions of India. They recognize Muslims, Jews, and Christians in India. Um, and the rest were lumped into one category, which they call um, Hinduism. They call them Hindus, and they call this religion Hinduism. Now, if we look, um, <clears throat> one of the reasons why we know that there wasn't such uh, um, an entity um, is because you know you have some Muslim scholars um, from the pre-colonial period uh, who never identified such a religion. Al Biruni is one of them. In his Kitab Malil Hind, he speaks of um, um, <clears throat> uh, the religions of India, Adyan Al Hind in Arabic. Um, in other words, he to, to him those people who were neither Muslims, Jews, nor Christians um, uh, were followers of various faiths, of various religions. That's why he referred to their religions in the plural, the religions of, uh, of India. Um, if you look at Darashikur, uh, uh, um, the, um, uh, you know, the Mughal um, uh, from the Mughal royal family, the, the Mughal family, and also um, <clears throat> a, um, uh, what was he? I think he was the um, brother of Aurangzeb. Um, <clears throat> now, he, he wrote this work, Majma al-Bahrain, uh, which is, you know, a kind of comparative study between Islam and the religions of the Indians. There again, there's no uh, reference to a single unitary religion um, um, Called Hinduism or by any other name, um, and he was writing in the in the seventeenth century. So he refers to the uh, to the the Indians as um, uh, Muvahidane Hind. His work was in Persian, so he referred to them as Muvahidane Hind, the the Indian monotheists, and he also referred to them as Hakshenas, the 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 people, uh, the, the, the 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 I guess you could say the truth knowing uh, group, and so on. And we have many other examples um, of scholars who, um, you know, who never referred to, um, who, who did not engage in this construction of, uh, of, of a, a new religion, as it, as it were. In others, they did not, as far as those Muslims were concerned, they did not look at um, the religions of India through the lens of Islam and constructed an image that was not in line with the way the Indians themselves um, uh, understood and experienced their their faiths. Um, 
So the, the, these are the problems of, uh, uh, this is the, the central problem to me of, uh, of Eurocentrism, Eurocentrism today. <clears throat> now, as far as Ibn Khaldun is concerned, um, his legacy is very much um, um, a victim of Orientalism in the sense that although he is widely known, although um, many uh, social scientists in sociology and anthropology and geography and other fields uh, in the West know of him, and many even regard him as a precursor of uh, various social sciences, he is still marginalized in the sense that he is rarely seen as a knowing subject. What I mean is that he is not seen as a source of theories. He's seen as, as a source of information and data. There are many descriptive, work, descriptive works on his um, theoretical perspective, but rarely is, is his theoretical framework actually applied to the empirical study of uh, you know, various cases, you know, uh, empirically applied to the study of um, Ottoman history or uh, Maghrebi history or Mughal history, um, uh, or you know, applied to the uh, study of the, the Mongol conquest of China. This is hardly ever done. So Ibn Khaldun, therefore, is an object of, uh, of study, but not a subject through which one um, studies. And this is the fate not just of Ibn Khaldun, but of virtually every scholar from the non-Western tradition, not only from the Islamic tradition, but from other uh, traditions outside of the, of the West. And this is a state of knowledge production today. It is very much a state of uh, coloniality. Um, so my interest had, has been to, um, uh, to look at Ibn Khaldun as a lost tradition in sociology. In, in, a, in a book I wrote um, a few years ago called Applying Ibn Khaldun, my interest was to not just reconstruct his, uh, his theory, but to suggest that there could be a neo-Khaldunian theory of the rise and decline of states, a neo-Khaldunian sociology. Um, and I tried to, uh, you know, to, to apply uh, his, uh, his theory of state formation to various empirical cases, among them you know, being the the rise of the Ottoman Empire, the rise of the Safavid Empire, uh, and the rise of the, the Wahhabi uh, state in, um, in Arabia. Um, so th this is basically my, you know, my, um, my, my perspective. Now, I don't really have the, the time to, to go into all the details of his, um, his um, theory of state formation, uh, but what I would like to speak more generally about his approach and also his uh, his method. Um, let me let me say something about his approach. He was uh, was clear. Uh, it was it was clear to him that he had uh, discovered a new science, which he called the science of human society, ilm al ijtima al insani, which he, he called it that. Um, and he, he said that he discovered this new science because such a science was necessary in order to be able to distinguish fact from fiction in history. He said that the reason why many historical accounts um, were erroneous um, was because there was a lack of understanding of what was possible and what was impossible in history. Let me, let me give you an example of that. Um, Ibn Khaldun said that um, there was a rumor circulated among the Abbasids in the third century um, about a particular Idrisid uh, ruler from Morocco. This, this was a ruler um, uh, by the name of Idris, Idris bin Idris. His father's name was also Idris. So it was said that Idris, Idris bin Idris 
was not really bin Idris. He was the illeg illegitimate um, child um, of um, a client of Idris. Um, in other words, um, this client of Idris by the name of Rashid had uh, uh, an affair with uh, the mother of Idris. Um, and Idris um, um, was a product of this affair. Um, and this was circulated. Uh, this rumor was circulated and believed by many people. Now, Ibn Khaldun said that in order to ascertain whether this khabar, this fact, this, this news, this information was true or not, you have to know something about the nature of society. So in this case, in this particular case, he said that the father of Idris and Idris' mother lived in the desert for some time in Morocco. They lived in the desert. And the nature of desert life was such that people lived in close quarters. There was no notion of privacy, the kind of privacy that uh, people had in cities. And that therefore it was not possible for a woman to have an affair with a strange man and to give birth to a, a baby and to keep that hidden from society. So if you knew something about the nature of society, the nature of desert or nomadic uh, uh, society, uh, what he called Umran uh, Padawi, um, you would know that this rumor could not be, be true. Furthermore, the Berber tribes in Morocco, who were all behind Idris bin Idris um, as a ruler, they were his supporters, would never have supported him had there, had there been such uh, rumors or had they believed such uh, rumors. So what Ibn Khaldun is saying is, that when you receive information, when you receive khabar um, uh, about history, you have to look into the, the imkanat or the istihalat. What he means is the possibility or the impossibility of these reports. Um, you have to decide whether they, uh, it's possible that those events as reported could have happened or impossible. Uh, and you use that as a basis of, um, you know, uh, accepting or rejecting those, uh, those khabar or those, um, those reports. So in other words, to know truth and falsehood in history, there must be an auxiliary science, which is a science of society. And that's why he discovered um, his science of, uh, of society. Um, so this is his basic uh, approach. And, um, but he was in particular, in, in particular interested in the rise and decline of dynasties. Um, and and uh, for that reason, he, he went into details on, on the rise and decline of dynasties um, and you know, uh, looking at various um, key um, factors um, and various key concepts that, that, underlie, that underlie, underlay those factors like um, you know, Asabiya and um, types of authorities such as caliphate authority and a mulk uh, authority and um, the uh, different types of, um, of forms of um, solidarity, such as asabiya, such as uh, clientship, such as alliances, and so on. Um, but I think what is important is um, is to to understand um, his overall approach, uh, which is this distinction between. Um, um, the possibility and impossibility um, of, uh, of events. Um, and um, in terms of uh, uh, developing non-Eurocentric um, sociology or non-Eurocentric social science, Ibn Khaldun is a very important um, candidate for that because um, unlike many other thinkers in Islamic tradition, um, Ibn Khaldun's work comes extremely close to, to social science and um, especially fields like anthropology um, and geography and historical sociology. Um, there is already a ready theory um, of the rise and decline of states. Um, there is something of a sociology of religion in his, uh, in his writings. Um, but what Ibn Khaldun lacks is um, some uh, of the developments that took place in um, 
modern social science and Western social science, uh, which are necessary to integrate into Ibn Khaldun's um, theoretical framework. For example, um, Ibn Khaldun, um, when he talks about the rise and decline of uh, dynasties, um, has no conceptualization of the economy. Um, he speaks about social groups. He speaks about um, uh, two, uh, two basic modes of um, uh, social integration um, and two modes of social life, namely um, sedentary society and um, uh, nomadic society. But he doesn't conceptualize the economic systems. Um, so in order to strengthen his theory, we may bring in notions of um, uh, political economy from modern social science. For example, um, the Marxist notion of the mode of production um, can be um, uh, brought in. Um, and in that case, um, we could say that um, the sedentary society described by Ibn Khaldun consists of two or three modes of production. Uh, such as petty commodity mode of production, um, um, uh, the Asiatic mode of production, um, and the uh, nomadic society that Ibn Khaldun talks about, Umran Badawi, consists of the pastoral nomadic mode of production. Um, we may also bring in Max Weber's um, concept of prebendal feudalism, which actually um, um, is a good can be, can be utilized as, for, as a good description of an aspect of what Ibn Khaldun refers to as sedentary um, uh, society. Um, now, I'm not going into all the details, but I just want to impress upon you, you know, the, the possibility when we do non-Eurocentric social science, the idea is not to reject Western or modern social science, but it's to integrate what we have from Islamic tradition into uh, um, with uh, uh, the uh, the best of the Western tradition, or at least what is relevant from the from the Western tradition, but in doing so, we should not run into the problem of um, a Eurocentric interpretation of Ibn Khaldun, um, because that is exactly what is happening. I've mentioned to you the distinction that Ibn Khaldun makes between Umran Badawi and Umran Hadari, which is uh, pastoral nomadic society and sedentary society. Now, I find that in many writings on Ibn Khaldun, including writings um, by Arabs, who actually should know better because Arabic is their, their mother tongue, but I come across um, in their writings, um, the um, understanding of this distinction between um, Hadari and Badawi, they put it in terms of um, urban and rural. Now, this is actually quite erroneous because um, by Hadari and Badawi, Ibn Khaldun did not mean urban and rural. Now, why it has often been, this, this dichotomy has often been understood. And when, when people write in European languages, they translate it as urban and rural. Why that has been the case? Probably is because, again, they are looking at Ibn Khaldun through the lens of European experience. Now, in Europe, the, the most important dichotomy in European history, you know, when you talk about the rise of modernity, the coming of modernity, um, the, the most important distinction is between town and country, between um, town and country. Um, now, in other parts of the world, that is not the most important distinction. For example, in my part of the world, in the Malay world, the most important distinction is between land and sea, because the sea is also populated. The sea is not only a means of transportation uh, this, uh, between you know, land masses. The sea is also populated. So we make a distinction between, for example, historically, between the Orang Laut and the Orang Darat, the land people and the, um, the, the sea people. And even in land itself, um, in, in Sumatra, in um, the Malay Peninsula, in many parts of the, the Malay world, on land itself, a, a very important dichotomy is between upstream and downstream. 
because of the importance of rivers in our political economy and political ecology. Um, now the same goes for, you know, for Ibn Khaldun's um, geography, uh, for his ecology. The important distinction is not between town and country, it is between sedentary and nomadic. Now sedentary in Ibn Khaldun includes town and country. The Umran Hadari, which is um, sedentary society, includes both town and country. And that is one, um, for Ibn Khaldun anyway, that is one mode of um, living. And the other mode of living is the nomadic um, mode. Um, so, as, so it is very important that, um, that we, you know, that when we are trying to reconstruct uh, Ibn Khaldun um, and integrate his ideas into modern frameworks, uh, or to combine them um, with modern frameworks, uh, that we, we, you know, we understand his, um, his ideas uh, from his perspective, from his point of view, uh, and not from a Eurocentric um, perspective. Um, I, um, I want to make two other points. I think, I believe my time is, uh, must be running out. Um, uh, it's right? okay, you, no, this, this time, this time, please, if, if you have okay. more to say, please go ahead. Okay, um, so I, I've said something, you know, very brief, um, uh, I've spoken in very broad terms about Ibn Khaldun's um, um, theoretical framework. Um, I want to mention something about his, uh, his method, his methods, uh, and I don't mean his methods of data collection, but his methods of argumentation, um, uh, which I think is an important lesson for, for the modern social sciences, particularly um, um, sociology. Um, Ibn Khaldun applied um, at least three methods in his work. In his and in this sense, he he was you know heir to the 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 Greek uh, and Islamic traditions. Um, the, the the four methods recognized the methods of argumentation uh, recognized by by the Muslims in his time were um, uh, demonstration, dialectics, poetics, and rhetoric. Um, demonstration, which um, basically refers to deduction and induction uh, is what today we call the um, modern, uh, the scientific method. Um, now, when Ibn Khaldun was doing a critique of existing history, when he was doing a critique of the, the works of uh, historians that came before him, his method was dialectical, um, what, what the Arabs call uh, jadal. But when he constructed his uh, um, in the Muqaddimah, when he constructs his theory of uh, the rise and decline of states, his method was um, basically a combination of deduction and, and induction. But he also applies um, um, rhetoric. He uses, you know, a rhetorical um, uh, uh, tools or devices in order to make certain arguments. For example, a very simple example, uh, um, in, in his quest to show that it's possible to speak scientifically about history. Uh, in other words, um, to, to speak of rules or laws that govern history. Um, he wants to say, he wants to tell us that um, what happened in the past is repeated in the future. And to get that point across, he said that the past resembles the future more than one drop of water resembles another drop of water. Uh, just to give an example. Um, and um, um, I think uh, as heir to that tradition, you know, the tradition which um, doesn't confine itself to one method, um, that's an important lesson for us today, especially in sociology and, and some other social sciences, but political science certainly, to some extent, I think geography also. Um, because um, in the modern social sciences, we tend to confine ourselves to the so-called scientific method to induction and deduction. Um, uh, whereas um, I think one could make an argument that, um, uh, you know, methods such as poetics and rhetoric are extremely important um, in order to um, convey um, ideas, to make truth claims. 
Um, for example, um, we can learn as much about the nature of society um, from uh, novels as we can from you know, sociological works. Um, if you take the concept of alienation, for example, um, Marx's um, economic and philosophic manuscripts, where he's, which he has a few pages where he discusses, he defines alienation. It's very important and very um, useful, but we can also learn, perhaps we can learn more uh, about alienation by reading Franz Kafka's um, uh, you know, Metamorphosis um, or by, um, by um, reading um, uh, The Outsider of Camus and so on and so forth. Um, um, it's a different mode of learning. Um, the, the mode of learning through poetics is um, through um, experience, through imagination, um, uh, what, the, what the Arabs call the takhil from khayal. Um, it's, it is a legitimate um, mode of argumentation and a, a legitimate means of arriving at a certain understanding of, of reality. It's just different from what we call the scientific method. And I think as far as method is concerned, this is something that we, um, we, uh, we can learn from, uh, from Ibn Khaldun. Um, <clears throat> now, the, the last thing that I want to say is that, you know, I, I think I've, I've um, tried to convey the, you know, the point that uh, there is a problem of Eurocentrism in modern knowledge production, and that Ibn Khaldun um, provides a resource for us to do non-Eurocentric knowledge production. But I want to also stress that um, the, pr the problem in knowledge production uh, for Muslims is not just um, Eurocentrism. There's also an internal problem, which I would like to call traditionalism. Um, this problem of traditionalism um, affects the way we understand our sources. And it has also practical consequences uh, in terms of our conduct as, as Muslims. Um, and I would like to give an example of that. Um, and this example um, also has, um, it, it's an example um, that you know, illustrates the, the, the um, the application of Ibn Khaldun's uh, distinction between the imkanat and the istihalat, the possibility and the impossibility of, um, of events in history. Um, I'd like to give the example from very early Islamic history. Um, many of you would be familiar with the, the story of the Bani Quraida. Um, the, the Bani Quraida um, was a Jewish tribe that lived in Medina. Um, and they were they were in Medina when after the uh, the Prophet peace be upon him migrated to Medina, um, and as you you would know, uh, the Prophet entered into a series of agreements with uh, uh, the non-Muslims of of Medina, generally the the Jewish uh, various Jewish tribes, um, known and, and this agreement was known as is known as the Sahifa. Um, known in the West as the Constitution of Medina, actually. Um, and uh, according uh, to this, uh, these agreements, the, the Jews would live in peace um, as part of the Ummah, and um, uh, they would be protected by uh, the Muslim rulers of the state. And in return for that protection, and in, in return for the the right to live by their own customs and religion and so on, they were not to um, ally themselves with the, the Quraysh, uh, who were at that time fighting against the, the Muslims. Um, most of the Jewish uh, um, tribes um, adhered to this, this uh, agreement. Um, now, during, according to the story that has, that has been handed down from uh, generation to generation among Muslims, it's in our, all our early uh, works, of his, uh, his historical works, according to the, the standard account, in other words, um, during um, the battle of Khandak, the battle of the, um, the trench, they call it, 
um, when the the Quraysh came to Medina uh, in order to fight against the Muslims, um, and and during that so-called battle, it was not really a battle because a trench was built on the advice of Salman al-Farsi. Uh, a trench was built, um, um, which made it impossible for the the Quraysh to enter Medina and actually engage in battle. There, there, there were some skirmishes, but um, um, there were hardly any uh, casualties. Now, after um, the, the, the Quraysh laid the 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 um, the Muslims in Medina uh, to siege for some days and eventually um, retreated and went back to Mecca. Um, when, this, when this so-called battle was over, um, the, it came to the Prophet's attention that the Bani Quraida had um, um, uh, had, had went back on the agreement and had um, said that they would fight alongside the the Quraysh. Now it's not known um, whether that actually happened or you know how many people were killed, uh, if at all there was actually any fighting on the part of the Bani Quraida, whether they had actually fought against uh, the Muslims. Um, but um, the story gives us the impression that that did happen. Um, and you know, to make a long story short, um, the Prophet, um, on the advice of some of the Sahaba, um, had the the entire group of the Bani Quraysh, the, the men and their wives and children, brought from their um, residence, from their area, which was just out, a few kilometers outside of uh, uh, Medina, brought to Medina itself and held in the house of uh, a particular lady, a, a, a widow, a, a, a widow, I believe. Um, and, um, and during that time, um, over the course of several days, negotiations were underway uh, to decide what was to be done with them. And um, the negotiation between the representative of uh, the Prophet and um, the Bani Koraida. And eventually, it was agreed, in other words, the Abanu Quraida agreed to this, that all the men would be killed, would be executed, and the women and children sold as slaves. This is the story that we have um, inherited, right? And this is in our history works. There are hardly any critics of this story. It is, it is accepted as an historical fact. Now, if we were to apply Ibn Khaldun's uh, way of thinking, um, his question would be, is it possible or impossible that these things could have happened? In others, you know, he says, imkanat or istihalat, possibility or impossibility. Um, um, I'm very sorry, we may have to wrap up very shortly for the question and answers. So if you yeah, could okay. uh, make the final point now, thank you. Okay, so the, I guess the final point is this, that um, uh, along many lines of reasoning, it seems that, this that the facts reported by this story uh, could not have happened. Um, for example, according to the story, uh, Sayyidina Ali and uh, Zubair were the two people who in a matter of hours executed 900 men of the Bani Quraida. Um, we don't know where their graves are. There, there are no graves of the Bani Quraida in, in Medina. Um, the, the entire tribe of the Bani Quraida during the negotiations were held in the house of uh, a woman in Medina. Now, we're talking about 4,000, 5,000 people, 900 men, their wives and children. Um, is there such a house you know, so big that it can accommodate so many people? According to the story, not a single man from the Bani Quraida said that they would convert to Islam in order to escape punishment. Not a single person tried to escape. Um, Sayyidina Ali never mentioned his uh, this event where he, you know, killed so many men in uh, in in, a, in the uh, in the process of a few hours. Not a single Jewish source, um, uh, contemporaneous, you know, to those events, mentions the massacre of the Bani Quraida. So, and there are many other, you know, um, points we can make. So, in other words. 
if we were able to be critical with regard to um, the standard account uh, using Ibn Khaldun's approach, distinguishing between the possibility and impossibility of, uh, of events, then we would tend to be a lot more critical than people have been. And, and let me just end by saying this, why do we need to be critical? Because this event of the Bani Qurayza is used by extremists. A few years ago, uh, um, a, a fighter from Al-Qaeda chastised Muslims for criticizing Al-Qaeda, not Al-Qaeda, I think it was uh, ISIS, chastised Muslims for criticizing ISIS for killing non-Muslims, for killing Christians. He said, why do you criticize us? We are following the example of the Prophet. The Prophet had killed all these men of the Bani Qurayza and sold their women and children as slaves. So why are you criticizing? We are simply following the, the Sunnah. So because we fail to be critical of our own tradition, um, and I'm talking about our scholarship, yeah? not critical of the Prophet, but critical of our scholarship. Um, um, these are the practical results that um, emerge from that. So uh, for me, the problem is not just Eurocentrism. That's an external problem, but there's also the problem of traditionalism. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Professor. Uh, we've got quite a few questions now emerging. Um, we're going to take them one by one. Um, we may go over uh, the hour. If people want to stay on, they're welcome to. Um, I'll start off, first of all, with a question from Yahya Burt, uh, who is based at Leeds University. Um, is non-Eurocentrism for you a way of rejecting any universal, global or comparative project for the social sciences? for something that is civilizationally specific? Or is a focus on using certain Islamic hate concepts for their universal analytical potential? And he gives an example of Salvatore's use of Al-Ummah. Yahya, do you want to add anything? So Yahya, but it's here. Assalamu alaikum. No, I, I mean, uh, I'm happy for Alia to, uh, to, to complete the question. I mean, but basically the point I was really asking is, what is non-Eurocentrism for you? Because the, the challenge for us is going to be, well, are we saying that we have an Islamicate set of social sciences based on Ibn Khaldun or some other uh, modern or, 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 or classical figures? Or are we saying that we, we, we can get uh, to a post-Eurocentric global sociology um, that is context sensitive, but could universalize certain analytical concepts from various civilizations uh, from around the world? You know, what's, what's your overall, what does is, what is post-Eurocentric sociology look like to you? Um, thank you very much for the, the question. I, it's the second that I actually uh, agree with, um, because my point is that um, there's an aspect of um, Western, soci Western social science that is parochial, actually. Um, and for me, um, the idea, the idea of decolonizing or doing decolonial sociology is to contribute to a universal sociology. Uh, and it's certainly not to be confined to, to the Islamic tradition. That, that's definitely not the idea. Um, of course, you know, as Muslims, we are in touch with, uh, or we should be in touch with our tradition. Uh, and that, that is certainly a resource for us. But um, there's no reason why we should be, um, be confined to that uh, tradition. Um, there are so many traditions, um, civilizational traditions, which are potential sources of ideas and concepts um, for the social sciences. Um, and, you know, we, um, we need to um, um, avail ourselves of those uh, different traditions. You know, I see it as, um, I see ourselves as, um, you know, something like chefs, good chefs. A good chef um, does not, um, uh, limit himself. First of all, a good chef will not ignore the herbs and spices that are, in, that are in his own backyard, in his own region. And that's what is what we are doing as, as you know, social scientists. We have a rich tradition of, we have a, a long tradition of ideas and concepts, um, whether we are Muslims or, um, you know, Buddhists or Chinese or Indians or whatever it is, there are, there are long civilizational traditions of ideas and concepts, and we have more or less completely ignored them. Uh, at the same time, a good chef, although uses, you know, using all the herbs and spices in his own uh, region or um, area, 
uh, is also interested in um, trying out uh, herbs and spices from, from elsewhere, from other uh, regions. And that is what we need to, to do. And I think in, in, the, in other cultural spheres, in cuisine and in music, we have done a lot better in terms of universalizing um, our um, you know, cultural production than we have in um, uh, knowledge production. Thank you. On, on that very really fascinating point, um, there's a question from Aisha Sayyid. Um, dis distortion and mar marginalization by the European outsiders is understandable to some extent. This is distortion and mar marginalization of Muslim thinkers. Why has there been a, has has there been a similar dilemma in the Muslim world? Are these great Muslim thinkers and scholars duly recognized by us Muslims? Um, no, I mean, they're not recognized. Um, I mean, you know, everybody knows Ibn Khaldun, everybody knows um, uh, Al-Biruni, um, but there are very, very few sociological or anthropological studies uh, that use them as a lens. Um, and the, situa the situation is even worse when you look at uh, the way we teach and, and, and the kinds of textbooks that we use. Um, first of all, in most of the, of the world, of the non-Western world, we, we use textbooks written basically in America and in Britain. And of course, in the Francophonic world, they use textbooks written in, in, uh, in France. Now, even in cases, um, so we use those textbooks or we translate those textbooks into our various languages. Even in cases when we, um, we write our own textbooks, they are modeled after American and British textbooks. Um, you know, let, let me give you an example. I was re recently reading uh, a book, an introduction to anthropology by an Indonesian anthropologist. Now in the chapter, he has a chapter on, or a section on society. This is in the Indonesian language, which is the same as the Malay language. Now, he uses the Indonesian word for society, but his description of society, his, under, his definition of society is basically the definition of the English society. It never occurred to him that the Indonesian term is not or shouldn't simply be seen as a translation of society, but should be seen as a concept in its own right, that has its own history, that has its own connotations. That never occurred because he is actually, in writing a textbook, he's actually translating. Uh, in reality, he's actually translating from, you know, from, um, in his case, from the American uh, tradition. Um, so there's a problem in conceptualization and certainly there's a problem in terms of leaving out all the, 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 you know, the non-Western uh, thinkers. So um, when, you, when we write about, uh, when we, we teach a course, um, undergraduate or graduate level courses on um, anthropo anthropological theory or sociological theory, uh, there's hardly any mention of um, thinkers from outside of the, the Western tradition. Um, in my own part of the world, one of uh, a very important thinker was Jose Rizal. I don't know if any of you are familiar with Jose Rizal. He lived at the end of the, he was writing towards the end of the 19th century. He was probably among the first to, to criticize European uh, colonial constructions of Filipino history. He was, he was from the, the Philippines. Um, he um, critiqued um, um, you know, colonial concepts and categories. He was probably the first to critique the colonial construction of the lazy native. Um, but you will only hear of Jose Rizal if you are taking a course on Filipino history. If you are taking a course on social theory, you will not hear of Jose Rizal, you will not hear of Ibn Khaldun, um, you will not hear of a host of thinkers from Asia and, and Africa who were writing in the 19th century. You will not hear about them because Sociological theory is universal theory, and universal theory means European theory. This is the problem with the way we are, are thinking. Uh, actually, on that note, Professor, there's a question very relevant to it. Foz asks, um, as you know, there's currently a movement to decolonize the curriculum, yet historical and contemporary contributions from Islamic or Muslim perspectives appear to be missing. 
Do you feel this is a fair assessment? And if so, why do you think this might be happening? Is it a product of our own lack of development or the further marginalization of Islamic forms of knowledge? Okay, I, I'm, you know, I'm not sure, but um, maybe the person who asked the question can, can clarify. Is, is, is he saying uh, that um, in the effort to decolonize the curriculum, they have taken into account other civilizations but left Islam out? Is that what he's saying? Um, potentially, yes. Foz, would you like to unmute your mic and explain? Hello? Okay, I, I, I don't, I'm not getting any sound uh, from Foz. Yeah, but... yeah Foz, um, I've tried to unmute Foz. Okay, yeah, should, they don't have a mic. They'll just do it on chat. Okay, okay. Um, so, uh, so th th the question is whether um, the Islamic contribution to knowledge is being left behind uh, from the decolonize the curriculum campaign. So um, there's a lot of, uh, as you know, around universities globally, there's a, there's a campaign called decolonize the curriculum. Um, and yeah. it seems that Islamic contributions are missing. Is that due to our own lack of development as Muslims or is it marginalization, do you think, further marginalization? You see, I, I don't think it's the responsibility of, um, of people who are decolonizing the curriculum to include every civilizational voice, right? Um, so, you know, if people in New Zealand are interested in, as, as they are, in fact, you know, you have um, um, this idea of decolonizing methodology um, in, that's come out of New Zealand. Um, and if they are interested in doing that in the context of, you know, um, um, uh, First Nation um, ideas, um, or in Australia, in terms in the context of Aboriginal ideas, uh, that's completely legitimate, and we don't say that they must include, you know, uh, Islamic civilizational uh, voices. Um, the the idea is to have the decolonizing sensibility, I think, and of course, you know, it depends on where you are. If you're in a place like India, um, obviously you have to be interested in in Islam when you are decolonizing the curriculum because Islam is a very important part of, uh, uh, of Islamic, uh, of uh, Indian uh, society. Uh, and the same thing goes for, for the UK. Islam is a very important part of um, British society and obviously decolonizing would have to take Islam into account. Um, but, um, um, and to, to some extent, one should be interested, I think, in all civilizations. You know, one should be, be cosmopolitan. But, um, uh, you know, the degree to which one takes interest in Islam really depends on, on the context. Having said that, it's the responsibility, first and foremost, of Muslims to contribute to the decolonization of the curriculum by including the Islamic uh, content, which means Muslims should study the, the tradition. Uh, now, one of the reasons why I'm, I'm quite critical of the Islamization of, of um, uh, knowledge um, project, I mean, at least some versions of it, um, or, you know, some schools of thought um, among them, is that they did not really take much interest in the, in the, in the Turath, in the, in, you know, in the, um, in the tradition or in the, in the, the heritage. Um, you know, they spoke in a very abstract manner about Islamizing knowledge, but um, didn't really go into Al-Biruni and Ibn Khaldun and uh, you know, the, the other earlier scholars to see how a modern social science can be extracted from these, uh, these thinkers. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Um, just for everyone who's still with us, we have gone past five o'clock. We've gone past the hour. It's now four past five. We're going to carry on for a little bit. If people um, need to go, that's fine. If you wish to carry on, uh, you're welcome to, but we'll probably wrap up in the next five, ten minutes. Uh, we've now got a question from Mohammed Hussain. Uh, and it's something actually you've just touched upon, Professor. How do you evaluate attempts such as Islamization of knowledge and notions such as Islamic sociology or anthropology as non-approaches, as non-Western approaches of study? So how do you ev evaluate those attempts? Well, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not keen on, on the idea of Islamization of knowledge or Islamic, for example, Islamic sociology. Um, First of all, I, my feeling is that it's actually foreign to Islamic tradition. Um, the, the idea doesn't, you know, never appears in, um, uh, in pre-modern Islamic uh, thought. Um, Ibn Khaldun, for example, refers to 
simply to a science of human society, not to an Islamic uh, science. And I think it's because of the idea that thinking theoretically, thinking um, logically, um, is simply a matter of the way the mind works. Um, uh, whether you're a Christian or a Muslim or, or an atheist, um, asabiya is not an Islamic concept. Um, a mulk, which is a notion of a certain kind of political authority, is not an Islamic concept. It's simply a concept that refers to the way um, uh, a certain polity uh, operates. Um, so, um, and when it comes to, 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 to methodology, um, you know, there is this idea that some people have been floating around for, well, it's been discussed, had been discussed since the 1970s, uh, Islamic methodology, which I think is a very strange idea because when you talk about um, uh, deduction and induction, there's no such thing as Islamic induction or Christian induction. Again, it's simply the way the mind uh, works. Um, uh, I, I think um, the we have to be clear about the whole process of knowledge production that, you know, um, it begins with, you know, our selection of a topic, our selection of a topic, our selection of a, a, a field of a focus might be guided by our religion, by our ethics, by our religiosity. We may choose to be interested in a certain topic because we are Muslims, because of our particular ethical standpoint or because of our particular values. Um, but, once we engage in the process of knowledge production, concept formation, theory building, data collection, religion doesn't come in. Um, uh, what comes in is our tradition, um, um, you know, the um, sources of ideas, uh, concepts from Islamic tradition, but certainly we don't restrict ourselves to Islamic tradition when it comes to um, you know, our sources of knowledge and uh, sources of concepts and, and ideas. The way, in which, the way in which we theorize, the way in which we use logic, um, these, um, this is where, you know, um, we're talking about the way the, the, the mind works. After having done that research, um, we take particular positions with regard to policy, with regard to politics, then Islam comes in again. Uh, um, our values come in again. Um, so, um, it's clear that Islam does influence the process of knowledge production, but can we refer to a discipline or a method or a methodology as Islamic? I, I don't think so. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. That's, um, that's really interesting. Um, we're going to carry on until quarter past the hour for those who are still with us. So that's quarter past five UK time. Um, I have another question, Professor, from Muhammad Gindi. How can Ibn Khaldun help us understand the modern state? I am not sure how to engage with Eurocentric knowledge. It seems to me that there is merit to use this type of knowledge, but it isn't clear what we need to do to sift through that knowledge. I'm having in mind people such as Pierre Bordeaux, Carl Schmidt, Giorgio Agamben, Karl de Clausewitz, Karl van Clausewitz, sorry, Thomas Hobbes, Niccolo Machiavelli, etc. So I think there's two questions there. How, how can Ibn Khaldun help us understand the modern state? And how do we engage with Eurocentric knowledge? Um, well, Ibn Khaldun can be useful in, in, in terms of understanding the modern state in, in two ways. One, I think, has to do with his specific theory of the rise and decline of, uh, of, of states based on tribal support. Um, you know, this interaction between pastoral nomadic societies and, um, and, and dynasties that are centered in um, sedentary society. Um, so in, in, in that case, his, his theory is of more limited applicability to the modern world. There are some states that exist today, um, which are amenable to a Khaldunian explanation. Uh, I think st states like Saudi Arabia, like Syria, Yemen, these are states to some extent, Sudan, Somalia. These are states which I think uh, do operate according to a Khaldunian logic. And, and Ibn Khaldun is um, uh, relevant uh, uh, in that case, in those cases. But there's a, a more abstract general level at which Ibn Khaldun is, uh, is relevant. Um, 
for example, if, if we're not cons in other words, at the more abstract level, we're not really concerned with um, uh, states, um, you know, formed on the basis of tribal military support and so on and so forth. We're more concerned with some more general ideas that Ibn Khaldun had about uh, the role of um, religion and uh, state formation and um, religious reform and, and so on. For example, um, the modern study of religious reform um, in, in sociology anyway, is, is really based on um, the study of institutions. Um, and it's based on the study of uh, ideas and ideologies. Uh, and it's not, um, this is you know, certainly a legitimate way of uh, studying uh, religious reform. But if we were to ask um, questions about religious reform from a Khaldunian perspective, Ibn Khaldun would be less interested in, in institutions um, and in ideologies, but more with the, the impact of solidarity, with the impact of asabiya. So for example, if we ask about the formation of the, the Ottoman state, or even if we ask, if we ask, let's say we talk about the formation of uh, the early Islamic um, uh, uh, polity in Mecca and Medina, from, from Ibn Khaldun's point of view, um, what is less important is the ideology or the ideas, but rather the role of um, the, the Asabiyah of the Quraysh, but in particular the Bani Hashim, uh, in terms of um, creating this, um, uh, this polity and um, uh, solidarity and the, uh, you know, the, um, um, and the institutions that formed later on. If we talk about the formation of the Ottoman state, again, Ibn Khaldun would be more interested in the... Um, uh, the kind of asabiya, the kind of social solidarity that was forged by by Osman and his um, and his tribe, and the way in which they were able to galvanize the support of uh, of other tribes and subordinate subordinate the asabiya of the other tribes. Um, so um, institutions um, and ideologies um, are in would be in the background in Ibn Khaldun's explanation, and asabiya would be. Um, you know, uh, more in the foreground. There's some interesting work done along these lines by, by the sociologist, the American sociologist, James uh, uh, Spicat. Um, and he has a very interesting book um, called um, something like non, uh, alternative, uh, it's about alternative sociologies of religion. And um, he spends some time discussing Ibn Khaldun in this manner. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, there's still a few more questions, um, but it looks like I need to come to an end now. Uh, it's coming to quarter past five. Um, it's been a really fascinating discussion, Professor Farid. Um, Thank you. Perhaps we can maybe send you the questions from uh, some of the people who haven't had their questions answered. Um, there have been some really, uh, I really welcome your insights and it's um, it's been quite an honour to listen to you. We've had some very uh, some very fruitful engagement from our um, from our attendees today. Uh, mm -hmm. I would love to carry on. Unfortunately, it's supposed to be just a little snapshot, just a one hour um, webinar. Um, uh, do you have uh, just on a on a closing note? Do you have any apart from your own work? Do you have any suggestions for reading in terms of um, uh, other social scientists who have managed to use and apply the work of Ibn Khaldun? Um, yeah, well, yes. Um... But, but you know, I can't. Uh, there, there are actually very few. There, there are a handful of people, and I've um, I've discussed them in my in my two books on Ibn Khaldun. Um, but I also wanted to mention, you know, I've written with a colleague of mine, Vinita Sinha, a, a book called Sociological Theory Beyond the Canon, in which we 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 you know uh, discuss both the the so-called founding fathers, the European founding fathers of sociology, as well as European founding mothers of sociology, as well as several non-Western founders of sociology in the 19th century. Um, for somebody who's interested in those kinds of questions, I think that's maybe a good starting point. And the references there, of course, will have some of these um, um, works that, um, uh, that are thinking along these lines. 
Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I look forward to looking up that reference. Um, and um, I'm sure all the attendees will join me in, in our gratitude towards, um, towards you and giving us your time. I know it's very late where you are now. It's coming after midnight. Um, thank you very, very much. And um, for everyone who's with us, I hope you can join us for the next few seminars from Islamic Circles as well. Thank you so much, Dr. Alia, and thank you so much, Professor Farid. Thank you very much. Um, we hope to much. host you again after Ramadan for maybe something longer uh, and something. You know, yeah, inshallah. Thank you. Inshallah. Thank you so I'm much. Enjoy it very much. No thank problem. Assalamu alaikum wa We will be sending the recording to everyone. We have your email addresses. If you haven't, please leave it on the chat. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, everyone. Take care. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.